Several years after my father's death, while looking through a filing cabinet, my mother and I discovered The Road to Los Angeles in a box among some forgotten screenplays. It took an accident and over 50 years for The Road to Los Angeles to find its way to a publisher. In hindsight, the book was ahead of its time, more postmodern than modern fiction, an early and unprintable catcher in the rye, full of anger and the madness of a young writer surviving in Los Angeles. Those are the words of the late Dan Fante, acclaimed novelist and poet and son of John Fante. And, as you've just heard, while The Road to Los Angeles wasn't published until 1985, after John Fante's death, it was actually the first Bandini novel that John Fante wrote. We're now going back to the early 1930s, before Wait Until Spring Bandini was published, back to when a young John Fante had a growing reputation as a short story writer. In this period, he had not yet married Joyce, had a different partner called Marie, and had had short stories published with Atlantic Monthly, The American Mercury, Story Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and others. In fact, as he wrote to his mother, who in all this world of young writers wouldn't trade places with me? I am in an enviable position, and I realise it and intend to make the most of it. In June of 1932, he wrote to his mother saying that he had received a letter from Alfred Knopf, who had published one of his short stories, asking Fante to let him know if he was planning on writing a novel. Fante told his mother that, I have answered that I have a long novel in mind, and that I will write one when I have the time and money. I believe that it will take me at least a year to write the sort of novel I want published under my name. By the end of the year, Fante obviously had decided that it was time, and in January 1933, he wrote to his mother to tell her that, quote, I've also written a letter to Alfred A. Knopf. I'm asking him for advance royalties on a book which I want to write. If Knopf will pay me enough to live comfortably for the next seven months, I can get off a fine book. Needless to say, John Fante was not short of confidence. Ross B. Wills told the story of meeting Fante for the first time and saying, so you're another one of those guys who's going to write the great American novel, are you? According to Wills, Fante stopped, raised his fist to the sky and said, 10, 20, why I've got 40 great books in me. Meanwhile, in a letter to his cousin Joe, Fante wrote, quote, I will write a great first novel, of this I'm positive. However, Fante's confidence seemed to fluctuate from month to month, week to week, even letter to letter. In another letter to his cousin Joe, in which he had complimented his writing talents, Fante replied that, quote, I'm so aware of my own deficiencies as a writer that for the moment, after reading your notice, I wondered whether or not here wasn't a polite slice of ridicule. Not long after reaching out to Knopf, Fante confirmed to his brother that he had, quote, signed the contract. I am to get $50 a month for the next eight months, and my finished manuscript is due in New York in November 1933. My book will be printed and issued in the spring of 1934. I have seven months and 450 bucks to write my novel, he said. This is pretty swell in my opinion. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing from here. A month later, he wrote that, quote, This book is a son of a bitch on wheels to write. So far, I've gone at it spasmodically and with great heat, accumulating 30,000 words. I destroyed the whole business this morning and started all over again. He even wrote to his mother asking whether she thought he should go back to Denver, as Colorado is where the majority of the book would take place, to see if that could help him with the book. Later that summer, Fante wrote a long letter to Carrie McWilliams, explaining his frustrations with his work so far. I am having trouble with my book, he said. Today I tore up 60,000 words, the toil of three months. I was absolutely fed up. I wish I knew positively what the matter is. I can't put my finger on it. There's something wrong, something changing in me, and I don't know what to call it, nor where to find it. The work I destroyed was not good work. I could see it. I was losing faith in it every day from the beginning. I tore up that work very deliberately. It was hollow, artificial. I started with a tricky style, found the easy thing to write, and went ahead. I hammered away day after day, just pouring words. It wasn't good stuff. I knew all along that I was playing a trick. Not a trick on not for anyone, but on myself. I have that feeling about writing. I know when I am honest and when I am cheating. The result horrifies me. I think what I have written is putrid. The white-haired boy, the kid who made the mercury when he was 20, and such disgusting who he is that, is the guy who is so plain in every sentence of this first novel that I would rather go to jail than have people read the book because there is no truth in it. I don't mean autobiographical fact, I mean something else. It's that feeling you get when you begin to write something you really love, that feeling of being in a stream and floating on and on without stopping. I was forcing it, and the result was never satisfying. The dissatisfaction plus the effort has made a physical wreck out of me. Maybe I am taking it too seriously. I sometimes think I have overestimated my own importance and significance. I really don't know for sure. Perhaps I should be digging ditches. 
After a couple of months and a couple of slightly more positive letters to his mother, where he indicated he thought he would soon finish the book, Fante wrote to his mother again, admitting, quote, My book is far from complete. I frankly don't know what I'm going to do about it. In November, he said he was still, quote, daily pounding away at my book, and in December he wrote that, quote, I am now in the last stages of my book, and by January 1st I hope to have finished it. His confidence in his work, however, was still not there. Whether it is good or not, he wrote, I can't say. In February of the new year, Fante wrote to his mother explaining the trouble he had had writing the book. Writing a book is a tremendous job, he wrote, especially the sort of book I'm doing, because I'm not sitting before a typewriter doesn't mean that I am free. Even when I go to bed, I have the same worries. It lies in my mind constantly, and I get horribly disgusted sometimes. There seems to be no end to the task. Finally, on April 8th of 1934, the month Fante had originally told his brother that his debut book was due to be physically published, Fante did actually mail a version of the manuscript, provisionally titled Peter Doloroso, to Knopf. The same day, he wrote to his mentor H.L. Mencken, telling him that, quote, The book is a flop. It fell to pieces when I tried to remove the superstructure. I wrote a million words and four drafts. Out of it, I got a 220-page hodgepodge. In May, Fante heard back about the manuscript. He told his mother that Knopf, quote, sends me some bad news in a way, for he wants me to do some more work on the book, and it is going to mean another six months of slaving. But I don't mind. The fact that my novel was sent back for more work is not bad news, and I don't want you to think of it in that light. By this point, having long run out of his book advance money, Fante had begun a well-paying job in Hollywood. While this gave Fante money he had never had before, it was not the work he wanted to be doing. Quote, I'm very anxious to make the changes in my book, as per the publisher's suggestion. Movie writing is a long way removed from book writing. I do want to get that book written, he said. It means more to me than anything I could ever possibly do in the movies. In another 1934 letter, Fante had written that, quote, writing for the studios is the most disgusting job in Christ's kingdom. In another letter to his mother, he said that, quote, I would love to have the work off my hands so that I could stop worrying and start another book. Fante's belief in this first novel attempt was waning, and eventually the progress of Peter Doloroso came to a final halt. In May 1935, two years after the original proposal was accepted, John Fante was in a place of reflection, and he admitted that, quote, when I look back upon the past year, I wonder if I have done what is best with my life. That first novel, he admitted to Mencken, was pretty bad. The book was truly a bad novel, and no one would have got any good out of its publication. Fante wasn't all doom and gloom, however. All in all, he said, I don't think I shall lose money on that ill-fated novel, even though it never saw publication. Instead, Fante had decided he would try and break it up into short stories to sell instead. Besides, more importantly, by June, Fante was writing to Carrie McWilliams again to let him know that, quote, I have started another book. This time I am a bit cagey in my predictions. I can only say that I have definitely got a good start. So, we're heading into 1936, and Fante is now finally working on what is to become the first Bandini novel. He has renewed enthusiasm about his prospects as a novelist again, writing to his dad that, quote, The book opens up many possibilities in the way of money. In the first place, it might sell well. In the second place, it might open up new contracts with magazine editors. And, in the third place, there are the picture people. A writer with a book under his belt, a good book, is worth good money in this town. In March of 1936, he sent the first part of this new manuscript, again, to his mentor H.L. Mencken. At this point, this new novel was provisionally titled In My Time. In the accompanying letter, Fante wrote that, quote, Arturo, my character in the book, he is me, and you might say I am he. I think it a representative picture of my type of young man. Mencken replied saying that the manuscript, as it stood, was, quote, long on discussion and short on story. This can't have been a massive surprise for Fante, who, in the accompanying letter alongside the manuscript, said that he decided against sending an explanation of what happens in the rest of the novel because, quote, nothing happens. Outside of writing, 1936 was a tough year for Fante. The year began with a difficult bout of illness. Reflecting on his writing process for The Road to Los Angeles, Fante said that, quote, I wrote it in three weeks in a sick bed, suffering from acute indigestion. Wrote the whole damn book in longhand and sent it to a typist in a hurry. And if it is a bitter book, it is because I was in a bitter black condition and got it out under circumstances which would have appalled and defeated the ordinary man. And so, all things considered, it is a pretty good book. Fante, who had written previously about his discomfort with the feelings he had of some kind of fraudulence with his first attempt at a novel, told Mencken of his new manuscript that, quote, This book is as autobiographical as the reader chooses to take it. The facts, though, are considerably different than the writing, but psychologically, it is as sincerely autobiographical as I could possibly make it. 
By June of 36, things were changing in Fante's life. Fante and Marie were separating, and Fante had a new idea for a title for his novel in progress. In a letter to Carrie McWilliams, he said that, quote, Titles always paralyse me. The best I can think of is The Road to Los Angeles. I have two or three others, Brief Passion, Harbour Days, The Oddest Fancy, but I don't like any of them. The Road to Los Angeles has a bulky sound I like. At the same time, he was writing to his brother to say that, quote, My book is a fine one, I am firmly convinced. It has some bad spots in it, but I'll take care of them as I make a rewrite. It will take two weeks after that to put it in final shape for the publisher. Somewhat prophetically, he added that, quote, I'm going to have trouble with the latter on account of the book's outspoken quality. It doesn't mince words. It's probably this fact that also made Fante feel the need to tell his brother that, quote, It is a sheer piece of imaginative writing, and though written in the first person, it is by no means a story about myself or anybody I know. Having previously told Mencken that he felt the work was, at least, emotionally autobiographical, we can only assume that Fante was a bit concerned that some figures in his real life might not appreciate the rawness of the text, and so he wanted to preemptively protect their reactions as much as possible. After finally finishing the manuscript, Fante wrote that, quote, The road to Los Angeles is finished, and boy, I'm pleased. Some of the stuff will singe the hair off a wolf's rear. It may be too strong, i.e. lacking in good taste, but that doesn't bother me. If literature needs blood and pain, its appetites shall be sated by the road to Los Angeles. So, after all that it took for John Fante to write The Road to Los Angeles, this book to bring blood and pain to literature, what's it actually like? Well, first of all, while this is the first Bandini novel John Fante wrote, it takes place after the events of Wait Until Spring Bandini. Sort of. It's not really a sequel, but it does again follow Arturo Bandini, who is now in his late teens, older than he is in Wait Until Spring. The book begins, I had a lot of jobs in Los Angeles Harbour because our family was poor and my father was dead. This is obviously already a major difference between Spring and the road to Los Angeles. In Spring, Arturo's father, Svevo, was a key figure. Here, his father has passed away. However, the death of Arturo's father is not the only Bandini family difference between the two books. He still has a religious mother, but gone are his brothers August and Federico, and instead, here, we have one sister, Mona. While Fante's father didn't die when he was young, parts of the setup for this book were plucked straight from Fante's life. Fante wrote that when he was young and his father had left, he, quote, had to go to work. Ye gods, how I hated it. The only work I ever did previous to that was play all sorts of ball, but I got a job and did a pretty swell job of keeping alive my ma and the kids. I had more than one job. I had 24 of them. While Arturo is still living at home with his family, this is much less a novel about family than Wait Until Spring Bandini. If anything, rather than having to deal with the friction in his family, Arturo is now himself the main cause of strife in the Bandini household. He is brash, confrontational, often delusional, and not contributing financially. He has a job as a ditch digger, the job Fante mentioned earlier in his letters that perhaps he should do instead of writing, but he quits on the very first page. He also works in a grocery store and leaves quickly, getting caught stealing $10 from his boss on his way out. When he's home, Arturo argues with his sister Mona constantly. Quote, she was smarter than my mother, but I didn't think she could ever approach my mind for sheer brilliance. Arturo's main bone of contention is her religious outlook. Quote, my own sister reduced to the superstition of a prayer. My own flesh and blood, a nun, a god lover. What barbarism. A further cause of the awkwardness between Arturo and his family is his use of the clothes closet, which Bandini calls his private study, where he locks himself away to admire the pictures of women in magazines like artists and models. Outside of the house, Bandini isn't any more reliable. He treats animals with exceptional cruelty, including ants, fish, and, most memorably, crabs. Surrounded by crabs, it is, quote, the big ones I want to kill and kill. The big fellows were strong and ferocious with powerful incisors. They were worthy adversaries for the great Bandini, the conquering Arturo. He starts off throwing stones, and then purchases an air gun to dispose of them more efficiently. Quote, I shot crabs all that afternoon until my shoulder hurt behind the gun and my eyes ached behind the gun sight. I was dictator Bandini, Iron Man of Crabland. They had tried to unseat me, those damn crabs, and I was getting revenge. It infuriated me. These goddamn crabs had actually questioned the might of Superman Bandini. At the end of the workday, he heads back home, where his uncle Frank is visiting again, and tells the family that he has got Arturo a job at the local fishery, which Arturo reluctantly begins. The pay is 25 cents an hour, he is told. The pay is of little consequence, he says. I am a writer. I interpret the American scene. My purpose here is not the gathering of money, but the gathering of material for my forthcoming book. Bandini, unsurprisingly, doesn't adapt well to his new job. Quote, 
Between vomitings, I stood at the can dump and convulsed, and I told them who I was, Arturo Bandini, the writer. Haven't you heard of me? You will. Don't worry. You will. I'm Bandini, the writer. This isn't essential, this job. I may give my wages to charity. Bandini's lofty declarations that he's a writer don't go down well with his colleagues. Quote, Hey writer, hey writer, I heard them gather around me, the laughter and the cackling. Hey writer, this was their idea of a really funny episode. One of them mimics Bandini's stance, pen and paper in hand, draws a picture of a cow and labels it writer. Arturo's perception of himself fluctuates wildly. For example, the day might start for him like this, quote, One morning I awoke with an idea, a fine idea, big as a house, my greatest idea ever, a masterpiece. However, the chapter next to this starts with, Get out there and look for what you'll never find. You're a thief and you're a crab killer and a lover of women in clothes closets. You'll never find a job. Every morning I got up feeling like that. After hearing about a few different working titles, Love Everlasting or The Woman a Man Loves or Omnia Vincit Amor, three titles just like that Arturo says to himself, amazing, incredible, genius, we finally get to experience a bit of Bandini's writing prowess. He writes about Arthur Banning, his hero, quote, There he was, a scion of a wealthy, famous, powerful, magniloquent family, a gallant homo with the world at his feet and the great, powerful, amazing Banning fortune at his disposal. And yea, as he stood there, something troubled Arthur Banning, tall, darkened, handsome, tanned by the rays of old soul, and what troubled him was that, though he had travelled many lands and seas, and rivers too, and though he made love and had love affairs the whole world knew about through the medium of the press, the powerful, grinding press, he, Arthur Banning, this scion, was unhappy. And though rich, famous, powerful, he was lonely, and encastellated for love. Bandini believes he has put together a thorough piece of work. Banning, he says, quote, in his yacht, went from country to country, had love affairs with women from every race and country in the world. I went to the dictionary for all my countries and there was none I missed. Bandini does eventually finish his Arthur Banning novel. Quote, at exactly 3.27am on Friday, August 7th, I finished the story. The last word of the last page was exactly what I wished. It was death. My hero shot himself through the head. I didn't exactly write that he pulled the trigger. This was illustrated by suggestion, which proved my ability to use restraint in a smashing climax. In fact, it is after finally finishing his novel, when the rest of the Bandini family reads it, that all hell breaks loose. I see you're absorbed, gripping, isn't it? Arturo says upon finding his sister Mona reading the manuscript. It's silly, she says, plain silly. It doesn't grip me, it gripes me. I had to laugh, she added. I skipped most of it. Why didn't your hero kill himself on the first page instead of the last? It would have made a lot better story. Bandini is furious and pins his sister to the wall, shouting at her that she is too stupid to understand the book. When he releases her, she throws a vase at his head. For peace of mind, Arturo turns to his mum, who assures him that she loved the book. Then, after Bandini gets belligerent, telling her she must be honest with him, she admits she thought that, quote, The hero was nasty. He committed adultery on almost every page. He was impure from the beginning. He turned my stomach. Bandini is furious again. He decides to give the book just one more read to confirm what he already knows, that he has created a work of genius. Quote, I open my eyes and try to read it. No good. It didn't work. I couldn't read it. I tried it out loud. No good. This book was no good. It was somewhat verbose. There were too many words in it. It was somewhat stodgy. It was a very good book. It missed. It was quite bad. It was worse than that. It was a lousy book. It was a stinking book. It was the goddamnest book I ever saw. It was ridiculous. However, Bandini himself, of course, is not the one to blame. He knows exactly why the book doesn't work. No writing could be done in this asylum, he says. No art could come from this chaos of stupidity. He decides there's only one thing to do, that he must leave. This was an impossible place to write, he says. This kitchen was a detriment. This neighbourhood was a detriment. This town was a detriment. As we've already learned about Arturo, he is not adverse to theft, and as wait until spring Bandini showed us, even his mother is not safe. Here, quote, at the bottom of the trunk I found what I wanted. They were family jewels wrapped in a paisley shawl, two solid gold rings, a solid gold watch and chain, a set of gold cufflinks, a set of gold earrings, a few gold pins, a gold cameo, a gold chain, little odds and ends of gold, jewels my father had bought during his lifetime. Having taken the family jewels, he sits down and writes a farewell note to his mother, which he titles, Dear Woman Who Gave Me Life. In it, he says he has decided to forgive her for the events of his last night in the house. After pawning all the jewellery, Bandini ends up spending most of the money in a bar, sharing it with the barman, pretending that he is a Russian spy leaving town and that he has plenty of money to spare on expenses. The novel concludes, quote, 
Suitcase in hand, I walked down to the depot. There was a 10 minute wait for the midnight train to Los Angeles. I sat down and began to think about the new novel. Arturo's road to Los Angeles is complete and the door is open for a new Bandini novel. A Los Angeles Bandini novel. In spite of everything there is to enjoy about the novel, as we've already mentioned, The Road to Los Angeles wasn't actually published until after Fante's death. So, what happened? Well, first of all, Knopf, who had waited so long for the debut John Fante novel, seemed to think that The Road to Los Angeles wasn't what he had been waiting for. Fante wrote that he wasn't sure Knopf ever even read the book, but that he received a letter of rejection from Knopf's proxy at the publisher, who said that he was, quote, Sorry and bitterly disappointed that the writer of such brilliant short stories in the Mercury should do such a job as that particular novel. Fante also reached out to William Soskin at Stackpole, who later did publish Fante. Fante remembered Soskin saying that the chances of them purchasing the manuscript were, quote, not very bright, but that he could send it along anyway. Fante was unsure. So far I have not done it, i.e. sent the manuscript, he said, because I hate the idea of everybody kicking it around and forming a bad reputation of my work. I feel that it will do me harm in the future, when and if I wrote and tried to sell another book. They would remember me as the guy who writes so filthily. Perhaps by this point, Fonte had a hunch that his future working relationship with Stackpole was brighter than the future of the Road to Los Angeles manuscript. I myself am quite sure I have written a good book, Fonte said. Not a masterpiece or anything like that, but a good, solid piece of writing. But if not, Van Henley think differently, it's just too bad for me and not for them. They have nothing to lose, whereas I, if I want to be a famous writer, had better look at literature through their eyes and forget what I feel. What embitters me a bit is this. I wrote that book with such fearful honesty. I really sweated out the candour in it. I shall never again write with such unrestraint. All of which goes to prove that it's a poor policy to be honest and that it is much better to be artistic. Of course, it may be that the book is simply bad. In that case, I have no complaint, except the feeling that somebody, including myself, has been kidding me. The whole period, from the writing of this book to the attempt at selling it, has been very discouraging and I want to forget about it and get to work on something else. Fante did have one last roll of the dice, submitting the manuscript to Viking Press. He attached a submission letter along with the manuscript, and that letter is so funny to me that I'm going to read some longer portions of it here. I think it's fair to say that, by this point, Fante's faith in the road to Los Angeles was pretty much diminished. Quote, I take this opportunity to preface your reading of my book with a few of my own impressions of it. Let me insist that the book is badly in need of work. Let me point out that as it stands, I personally detest the book very much. Let me say further that with your encouragement, assuming that you can detect the value of the writing, I can and would love to do a careful and competent rewrite. It would be absurd for me to praise the book here, since I know now what it needs, and consequently I am going a bit further in my castigation of the work and tell you that actually the book is a very bad one which you would despise. But I do not deny that the book is very honest, that it will, I think, interest you not per se, but in revision, that it will give you some idea of the kind of writer I am and what I promise. I enjoy the vague distinction of having written more stories for the American Mercury than any other living writer. The present tendency of the Mercury being what it is, I can't say I particularly relish the distinction. The novel you get from Soskin is not the best book I hope to write. Indeed, I am quite sure it will be the worst, for my desire is to do a book on an Italian-American family a very large family, which is confronted with the problem of modern birth control and the attitude of the church on that tremendous subject. Since such a book will be autobiographical, since it will come from my blood and soul, since it will be based upon my own experiences, I cannot deny that it will unquestionably be a very great book which the whole world will admire and love forever and ever. If it fails, then I fail, and it goes without saying that I am of the calibre of man and writer who does not fail. I can trust my instinct in this matter, and my instinct is sure. But before I get on with that book, I want this present book which Soskin has to be done, and I hope you all help me out on it. I hope you like it well enough to sit down and tell me that this is wrong with it in your opinion, and that, and the other thing. I hope you will string along with me until I get it rewritten, for, in fact, I am perfectly aware of what is wrong with that book. Unsurprisingly, that letter didn't manage to persuade Viking to take the book on. And that was that. One more rejection, and Fante did finally put the novel aside, and begin working on his new novel, which he said was, quote, A most delicate proposition, it is the tale of a 14-year-old boy who writes of the mysterious confusion in his home. From this quote, it would seem that Fante was already formulating the ideas for Wait Until Spring Bandini. The manuscript for The Road to Los Angeles didn't go totally forgotten, however. As pointed out in the Fante Literary Reader, it seems like Fante reused a couple of elements for his 1977 novel The Brotherhood of the Grape, where he writes about the various jobs Henry Melise had while trying to make it as a writer. Aside from that, The Road to Los Angeles wasn't heard of again until it was finally published by Black Sparrow Press in 1985, two years after Fante's death. It was the second novel in the Bandini Quartet, the first Bandini novel to be written, and, ultimately, the last Bandini novel to be published. But, as for this podcast, we're still only on to book two of the Bandini Quartet, 
we've still got a long way to go with Fante and Bandini yet. As we leave Bandini at the end of the road to Los Angeles, he is heading off to LA, for the novel without which we probably wouldn't know the name John Fante today, Ask the Dust. And if you're thinking, well, that's the legendary one, surely that one had a more straightforward journey, I've got some bad news for you. (music) 